big stress. Uh, big honor to be here. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Taikan uh, team, to invite me again to, to speak, but this time as keynote for to, today. Um, excuse me by advance, but I will cover a lot of topics, so I need to read my text. So it will be a little boring. I hope not too much boring. Let's start. There is a problem with the presentation already. Yes, the right typeface are here. I'm so old that I'm part of these people we have learned to design typeface around 8790, using tracing paper as well, various analog techniques. Good eyes as well good hands was crucial. At the time, few they were necessary between the design of the letter forms on the ability to actually be able to judge your design on a small sample of text by hands. It has a fastidious process, but also because it was learning, I was learning how to draw good letter forms without any instruments based on calligraphy stru structure. Filling out the final drawings with a large marker on tracing paper was a slow but on painful process, but it also had an advantage, as during this moment, you can think about the shape, you can analyze the tension of the curves, counters, and weights. It's a way to slowly assimilate the form to think about possible change you will have to do in your design at the next stage. A bit like keeping a wine or wooden barrels, you will have to test it regularly until you will know that it will be the moment you can produce the final version to consume it. Back in the 90s, at the time students, not only the preparation of the sample of my first typeface, Angie, was long. Two full days just to set by hand a text of 10 lines based on film output, each letter cut with an exacto and glued on the document. But several weeks was necessary to send the package to Japan. By chance, Angie was awarded at Morisawa and it pushed me to continue. A few months later, when I joined the French design agency Dragon Rouge, everything was done analog there. For my personal use, I bought my first Macintosh as well Icarus, then photographer to learn all these tools at home as well to convince the design agency that a computer will be useful for lettering on alphabet design. Then two Macintosh have been installed at the agency to be shared by 80 designers, mostly to set text. I've got the chance to receive the third, but the first individual computer of the agency. Naturally, Illustrator was the main tool, but quickly I bring my personal license of font design application using until the agency bought me the necessary license. My plan was to publish NG. Before internet, upper and lower case was the best way to find contact in the type industry. It's how I decided to send letters to few venerable foundries to present my typeface. I have received very nice reply by post. It was a, the, uh, it was a contact in person with phone phone team was a trigger. Evans they told me that my typeface would have to be digitized first. By 92, I was already designing my second typeface, Apolline, partially by hand. Again, I worked at Morisawa in Japan. I still have to visit Japan. Following the reading of a piece by Charles Bigelow about Gallia, who was interpolated, you know what you call variable font today? and even extrapolated in 78. I decided to use interpolation myself in Icarus late, later with photographer for the intermediate weight, but no more. In 93, I was immersed into di digital design, switching to photographer to extend NG as well Apolline into family of six style each. For the next one, Le Monde Super Family, I have drawn directly on screen with basic curve. The immersion into digital world was total at the time. Today, we easily can change our mind about the detail. We are more productive, and globally, the quality of ty new typeface are much better, fully complete. But not sure if this, those pieces of design who appear on screen still belong to our mind. Those technology of already have taken the power of our human on the act of creation of a new shape or new idea. On Instagram, anything who looks to be drawn on tangi tangible piece of paper on the wall receives much more praise on an outline drawn on screen with busy curves. Yeah. Besides the easy explanation about trends, does there is something more profound happening we are not able to catch perfectly? As a designer, we have to think about our practice. 
to keep certain distance from the tool we use every day. Nothing is there for the rest of our life. The way we design today will, be probab will probably change the, in the next decade. I recall perfectly this moment of excitation when I was looking at the first ads on upper lower case from independent foundries in the early 90s. Stone type foundries, Carter and Cohn, Alpha Ben Corporation, the Fund Bureau. It was a way to understood that something was happening as well as the first type issue in the iMagazine. So launching an independent foundry in France was my dream, with the objective to gain independency and statute. You have to recall that in the early 90s, fund market was mostly the old stuff quickly digitized on one side, the other side, few pioneers, then the free fonts, the grunge fonts, the monolithic modular fonts. Selling phones via fax order together a tangible credit card machine as well sending floppy disks by post were always doing business at the time to reach customers before the internet on social medias. You're complaining about social medias all the time. There was no social media at the time. The only way, way, the only way at the time was to send printed specimen by post collecting few postal address in design annuals. Going to Thai conference such a Thai Pai was another good way to meet the industry, as well to share Thai specimen with others. Besides these, on expensive ads, no way to be discovered at the time. With internet, suddenly it was possible to reach more customers. In 96, I've got my first 56, 56K modem connection, very slow, yeah. And a few months later, in 97, I've set up a, a website under the name porchestipo.com hosted by John Hudson server in Canada, soon switched to uh, tipofondé.com, fabulous way to present typeface, even in somewhat very low resolution. Setting up a simple form to let people order the phone they wanted to receive the order by email, et voila. For sure, credit card payment was still a manual process at the time a dedicated tangible machine together with a phone and fax, but direct download and secure payment was up two years later. I still recall the first month of sale via this new system, 20 times more purchase than, than with a simple radio button based form. In early 2000, it was a moment of large develop development of phone market due to my phone launch in 2001 on more accessible way to launch your e own e-commerce system. At these precise moments, everything was in place for the revolution of type design. In addition to the existing mailing list from the 90s, forum like Typofile was also a crucial step to have the community in continuous contact between type conference. Companies like Adobe and Microsoft were working with the community on small foundries to set up high standard. Even colleagues inventing a portable phone format such as UFO and later, Woof, now the de facto the web font format. Sangstad, Lemming, Eric von Vocklund, and many others who have uh, imagined these kind of things. Today, our micro industry is more solid than in the 90s. Type conference, tangible and online communities, easy way to reach customers because of e-commerce, social medias. Large companies now understood the value of having their own best book typeface, family, and so on. Our small industry has become a multi-form professional sector this day, but be sure of one thing, our type world will transform again. Younger, I was into model trains, the youngest of, in a community of people of my today age. Later, I was embarked into the scooterist scene, Vespa, Soul Music, Scooter Club, and Scooter Rallies all over Europe. I have learned, learned something important. Sharing your passion in a community helps you to learn from each other. More you share, more you're getting stronger in contact of others. So entering in the type world, it was very natural to join non-profit organization to see what I will be able to do for the community. In 99, in 1989, I joined the Rencontre Internationale de Lure, an association uh, launched in the early six, uh, 50s by people like Maximilien Vox, Roger Scoffon, and so on, as well as the Association Typographique Internationale soon after. In 1989, I've got the chance to meet Matthew Carter 
in Lure in Provence, as well many of the French old guards such Ladislas Mandel. In the mid-90s, I was in charge of the organization of the one special day dedicated to type design in context of Rencontre Internationale de Lure. I invited Summerstone, Maxim Zukov, and others to speak. At ATIPI Reading Conference in 97, I was nominated French delegate on the Other of Life caused the Association Annual Conference to be scheduled in France the following year. Robert Norton was at the head of the Microsoft type office uh, who was, uh, was in charge to organize it. Sadly, he passed away in autumn of that year. So rather than just to assist him, as it was plain, Mark Batty, the ATIPI president, asked me to take over the organization of the annual conference, planned 10 months later. It, it means at the time, selecting the venue, venue, building the entire program, designing the identity, and so on. Crazy, but fabulous experience made possible because of the internet. The idea was to invite international speakers, but all the French typographic scene have to be represented. From the old guards such as José Mendoza, Albert Botton, Jean Larcher, and Ladislas Mandel, as well younger ones. It's at this moment that I have launched the publication called Lettres Françaises to bring together all digital typefaces published up to 98. Some things look impossible this day. There is simply too much font every day launched. Following a type by Lyon uh, 98, the question was how to continue to make this community growing locally. As graphic design, publication in France showed no interest into this new micro industry called type design. One idea was to inform people about the new French font on typography via our community website to get new clients. It's crucial to build an environment to share knowledge, good practice, ethics, and eventually helping people to be your competitor in the future. In contact with Dean Allen, the Canadian typographer who launched a new blog system called Text Pattern, I've got the chance to use his new tool to launch typograph.com in 2003. My model was a mix of typographica for the blog, handled by a small dedicated group on typophile for the forum, a place where people can discuss about type design as well typography in general in French. I started to teach on the same school right after I was graduated in 90. My first course started with basic typography and calligraphy, as writing was the basis of my type design education to understood letter form structure. Few years later, I realized how teaching can influence my daily practice, how ethics will be crucial in my career. Recall that in the 90s, before internet, sharing font on floppy disk was usual. In school, it was even worse. So from the first day, the idea was to limit students to system fonts only, or accepting student project only if there was a proof of the font license for the final term project. I wanted them to realize that buying just a weight isn't a big budget, and it will add value to their work as a young professional. Also, a way to let students think that their own typeface they will have to design on the, on the class have also a potential value. There was an alternative to become famous in one week by giving away your first font that you've designed. Today it's one day with the social networks. In parallel, conducting numerous successful workshops in typefaces in France and abroad pushed me to deviating from calligraphy as a main method to teach type design. Relying on calligraphy as an educational basis is certainly comforting and convenient for quickly grasping the typographic form. But it drives students to draw in certain style, restricting them from opening their eyes to other models both historical and contemporary. When you have three to five days and you want good results in your workshop, the right method is to have all the students working together as a team. A group of students is never homogeneous, with some better as conceptualizing or drawings, while others are more organized and efficient when making basic curve working. You have to ra rationalize much as you can. To be sure, nobody is left behind. Everyone should be involved. Even if some are better than others, the group got the power and energy to keep the project going on. At any time you feel that you have to repeat two times the same thing, it's rather more convenient to speak to the group, getting them to work together, taking on responsibilities in a small group allowed for quick results 
without the students losing focus at given stage and upward leveling benefit everybody. Then I've got the chance to be hired by the Ecole Nationale des Arts Décoratifs in 98 to replace Albert Botton himself, successor of Adrien Frutiger. This course was optional and open to anyone in final years interested in type design. As a result, I've, I've, I've got highly enthusiastic students such as Stéphane Elbaz, designer of Généo, PS Fournier, and more recent typeface who have been awarded by the Type Director Clubs. I have applied a collaborative working technique to my class at Ecole Nationale des Arts Décoratifs, building small groups inside the class. With four hours by week, it was the only way to be able to produce decent results. First semester, we used type cooker Python script, there was no website at the time for that, from Eric Van Bokland to build a brief in order to design full typefaces. The second semester was dedicated to a revival. To push people to learn about the history of typography, to identify good French models generally fully in your in English publication available at the time. Romain Duroy, Fournier, Perrin, Janet, etc. Exposing students to varied approach is crucial in education. I push them to conduct interviews with inter international typeface designers such as Susanna Lichko, Summerstone, Carol Tombley as well taking time to rediscover French classics such as Roger Scoffon and Fonnery Olive. At the same period, I was visiting late lecturer at the Reading University Master of Type Design, giving some advice to promising designers such as Nadine Shain, who will become a close friend ever since. When I discovered typeface design, I've got the chance to meet the right person at the right moment. There was no international school where nowadays many people feel obliged to go be and become professional type designer. After a necessary break of 10 years in typeface design teaching, I was back into it with new ideas. In 2012, Caradi Eduardo and Summerstone offered me to teach at Type Cooper Condensed Program. Naturally, I invited my past student, Stefan Elbaz, was based in New York to join me on this summer adventure. The same year, Karen Cheng invited me to the Washington University, Kali Nikitas, and Greg Lindy in Los Angeles proposed me to conduct workshop in their school. You, you know this typical question to which much, most of type designers answer yes. You know this question, yeah. Does the world need more typefaces? For sure, we want to continue what we love the most, designing new typeface. There is other question I I, that I keep asking to myself. Do we need to train even more forthcoming type designers to enlarge the community? Do we need more highly specialized full typeface designers? The immediate answer is yes. We practice inclusiveness in our small industry. And you cannot stop those individuals who really want to be a typeface designer. They will invent their own path, learning alone, or going to type media for one year. I'm sure there is some of them here in this room with even more incredible story to share than mine. But I have the feeling there is a target group we ignore completely. We don't need another hero such as Herman Zepp or Adrien Fautier. We already have dozens of them in this room. Our small industry is need much more graphic designers who know not only to follow the typographic rules in order to break them, but we have, we have to learn how to draw pro properly alphabet in the context of their day-to-day -day graphic design job. These people will be better graphic designers, but also to, to catch good fonts versus bad fonts in the market. I'm not asking for more YouTube video telling you how to use these plugins to transform an existing serif font into a sans serif. Graphic designers don't need this online tool who let you via slider adding round corners to an existing typeface for a branding project. It's too superficial. It's even not ethical. I'm advocating for course, a bit like in the same vein as this littering workshop conducted by Martina Flor, Ken Barber, Another wonderful designer who teach people to use their hands on brain. 
We know that a workshop of few days is not enough to learn typeface design, but also know that one year is probably too much for the vast majority of designers who will never become a full-time typeface designer. Typeris is a conjunction of my multiple experience. Building a community is the basis of everything I'm doing. At Typeris, we have a core group of instructors working as a solid team, rather than individual instructors visiting students. In our group, we have senior instructors as well as junior instructors. We always teach as a tandem, and we report a lot via Basecamp, the online tool we use. We have designed a syllabus together, a super precise schedule. Each year, we try to improve it using attendees' feedback or based on our own fail. We are not perfect as human. The world will work perfectly for one attendee will not work at all for another, one who needs help to progress. The daily reports we share in our core group help us a lot to follow precisely what's happening in the class. Who needs the right guidance the next day to move forward? As you understood, our core group of five instructors works closely together, so the message we deliver to attendees is consistent. But we count a lot on the five additional international guest scripts we invite each year to challenge our message. As conclusion, attendees are often a little bit confused by these visits equally blessed, but this is a goal in order to force them to ask the right question, to exercise their critical sense. But Typeris is, is much more than just a class. It's also a place where we build a community, as attendees refer to it. They appreciate a lot the group through the constant interaction, the social life. We create around visit diner parties. The TP talks we organize freely open to the public bring together the guest crit, type crit of the week together with the graphic designer, art director, user of typography. These talks play an important role, a goal. Type design isn't a separate world. It belongs to a larger group of design industry. We have to avoid maximum this comfortable separation. When two typeface designer discussion isn't comprehensible by a graphic designer who join the group, we have to rethink our goals on, on open more or micro community. History shows different styles depending on the country of Europe where the typeface was designed. But this doesn't make an absolute truth about the necessity to have fully different typeface styles depending on the country. As example, Bodoni as well Dido are similar in style. One designed with founding of the Italian monarchy on pop in Italy, the second during the French Revolution. Today, as you can expect, fashion brands never select Dido for its revolutionary tone, as well the monarchy reference for Bodoni. What makes typeface more suitable to certain news is the context since the beginning of graphic design. We make them both. The typical typeface for fashion industry is that Bodoni and Dido are used on fashion magazines all over the world since the 20s, nothing else. So maybe the historical reference have an influence, but first, it's their use who create typeface association. When you work for clients, connotation play a major role, but you have to teach your clients to understand how to analyze the typographic reference you bring to them. You have to push your client outside their comfort zone, such as, I want the same typeface as my competitor. Indeed, a client rarely came from with a precise idea of what he wants. In fact, designing a typeface for a purpose isn't so different than building an identity. Maybe you have another layer with the historical knowledge of typography, typefaces, and connotation. Especially for clients like Vuitton, Yves Saint Laurent Beauty, Galerie Lafayette, one of the first things I always ask to them, do you have archive in your company? It helps to start a new design from their roots to pick up on their archive what makes them different and genuine. Always better to build a typographic identity from genuine history rather than just following the global trends who end up to something similar and boring. All the shape of a letter's conveyed concept isn't an easy thing to understand. 
It's all about culture, art, history, perception. Historical reference and analogy are great tools to explain. In case of Le Monde, the story was a bit different. Everything started from my side with a letter to the editor in 94, suggesting him that a new typeface can help to make their newspaper better. The first idea was to explain to the editor there was no art director at Le Monde at the time, that the typeface they will, they will use should, fo should, should follow their vision. Or a center left newspaper can use a typeface made for an English conservative newspaper who is pro-monarchy. It worked very well. <clears throat> the cherry on the cake happened 10 years later when the Spanish daily ABC wanted to use Le Monde Journal. <clears throat> this conservative pro-monarchy newspaper asked me to change the name as it was difficult for them to use a center-left typeface for their newspaper. My reply was for sure, we can change the name of the typeface. I proposed them a, a quite high price for the change of the name. I recall it that the Le Monde was used, uh, that Le Monde newspaper used it for years time New Roman without any political problems. They end up finally keep the typeface in their Le Monde journal name. This part it, um, it, um, is, is there because of the special request of, of some American friend or, or Neil in particular. It started from a simple private message on Twitter in February 2017. They approached me to, me to design a message to support Emmanuel Macron campaign. The idea was to follow what was done during the Hillary Clinton campaign, collaboration with designer. What the En Marche creative director, Thibaut Kayserk, was not, not aware at the time is that I was already engaged locally since a few months. After the Brexit, is still, still not finished. Then Trump election is still there. I have to do something, not just complaining. GFK advice was the best option for me. You know this, uh, this one. My fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you do for your country. The outcome was just a sticker because this was too late on the campaign, but the design was the basis of a larger project. So I meet the small team at En March HQ and share what happened with Hillary Clinton the year before. Back in 2016, Hillary Clinton creative director, Jennifer Keenan, decided to select PS Fournier in addition to the sans serif design by Luca Sharp. The idea was to create more formal, more president presidential tone for American candidates. Two weeks later, in France, via the Telegram apps we use every day, Thibault asked me to send some tests featuring various typefaces. He selected Menken, who was the typeface used for the verbatim of the candidate at the end of the campaign and become the first official typeface of the president, Emmanuel Macron. The one used for the now no famous Make Our Planet Great Again. Message published just before midnight on the 1st June 2017 together with a speech in English in answer to Donald Trump announcement to keep the Paris Climate Agreement. During the summer, Thibaut Kayser, now creative director at Palais de l'Elysée, the French White House, wanted to reconcile, reconsider the identity. Menken featuring a quite large excite. He wanted something else in addition to the typeface now called Aiglon based on the sticker. First idea was a Garamond, but I told him that it was not the right choice. Yeah, it's a French typeface, Garamond, yes. But it was, it was a typeface used by the king of France. The symbol was not there. They needed something rather to convey the expression of the French Revolution. I suggested them P.S. Fournier was born during the Age of Enlightenment. In addition, a typeface for formal invitation called Altes was selected. Little later, they asked me to collaborate with them for the identity of the Palais l'Elysée they worked on. So I have redesigned the monogram Republic Française in several versions, depending on the use, the size of use, the RF. This typeface trio is now the official set of typeface used for the identity websites and communication used from Twitter, Instagram to any official events. It's a big honor to serve my country through this set of typefaces. A bit weird to read message announcement set in Aiglon almost every day from Emmanuel Macron on Palais de l'Elysée, knowing that until very recently, they still use a early beta from summer 
2017. We are, still, we are still working on the Aiglon family with my team at Tipo Fondry. We almost finished the italics this summer. Thank you, Rogero, for this work. So I'm very pleased to show you the current state of this large project. In the future, Aiglon will be naturally available at Tipo Fondry. That's the last part of my talk, the second part, in several chapters. As practitioners, we are all influenced by our direct environment. We follow trends, we try to understand them. Some of us spend hours on Instagram to spot the last new trendy typeface, others read regularly dedicated websites. At the foundry time to time, when a new typeface is launched, we discuss about it together. We're going into it further than just a few images on, on social networks. We download the PDF specimen. We look at, at it at text size, spacing. We enlarge glyph at maximum size. We, we check the glyph set, accent positioning, and so on. The idea is to exercise your critical sense, to debate about it using reference, to share opinions to push junior designer to have a point of view based on the real observation of the craft level. All the design challenge was addressed. At Typeris, one of the first things I'm saying to my students, during the next five weeks, please stop to visit Foundry website. Avoid to log to any contemporary typeface specimen. Don't look at the font you bought recently. Rather, look at all books, read about the history of typography, open your eyes, observe and analyze vernacular sign around you. In any case, avoid it. It's good because it's the last typeface by this trendy designer. Idea came from your own internal creative process, historical reference. Idea should never came from a recently published typeface that you fall in love as a designer. Building a critical eye is much more important than to be on the trend by copying others. When we start a new typeface, we have to escape any external influence from contemporary design. There is many different kinds of piracy. It starts by a guy who wants to discover how you've designed your typeface, but will never use them. There is this 200 designer staff agency who bought one seat license and installed this font on every computer. There is this internet forum where people share movie, porn, and fonts. There is this trendy designer who stole your outline, changed few points to publish a crappy new trendy typeface. All of them need different answers. The most important thing about piracy remains. Yeah, there is a problem with the font here. <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, the most important thing about piracy remains to explain what is a good practice to young designers, user of font as well type designer. I, I'm, you know, because of the bad font, you know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are not in the 90s anymore, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm lost completely now. <laughs> The most important thing about piracy remains to explain what is a good practice to young designer, user of font as well type designer. A user of an illegal font kills the client acquisition strategy. For sure, at short term, he is able to charge less his clients against his graphic designer competitor. But at long term, he destroys the value of what makes good design, the design that he sells to make a living. As well for people around him, he means the opportunity to build his own ecosystem. Stephen Heller is very clear about type designer bad practice. Stealing a font or tweaking an existing font or calling it your own is much easier. So don't be this guy who produces work based on, on that of another. You will kill your reputation. You will give argument to excuse user piracy. Working on, on typeface revival means 
that you shouldn't be tempted to compare the historical source with contemporary interpretation from your colleagues, never. But what is the definition of a revival? Let's say that if you base a new design from a book set in Antoine Augereau type from 1531, it's a revival. What happening if you reference the original punch stored in the National Library? Then if your basis is a printed specimen of famous grotesque from early 60s. Or if your reference came from the digital world, such as Adobe Garamond. Let's go further. Your own design based on Antoine Augereau type is finally published. Type critics will comment it. Some will say that it's a beautiful revival of French typography. Some others will say that they prefer the revival of the same source by someone else. Yes, it happened all the time. During the design of Gallia, Matthew Carter and Mike Parker came to the conclusion that the perception of style is subjective. It must be assimilated and recreated as a whole. About revivals, Jonathan Hoffler explained in an article on Wired by Stephen Heller, we explore the idea behind a collection of physical artifacts and interpret them as a family of digital fonts. Heller explained well the process. Hoffler's team deconstructs a reference typeface, studies the elements that make its letter form unique from an aesthetic or structural standpoint, then reassemble it in a unique way. Thus, there is a criteria to judge if a typeface is a revival or not. Back in 2001, submitting my Ambroise to Big Varal's competition organized by Maxim Zukov at 8 I have checked the option revival. I was told by the jury that Ambroise was not a revival. Hmm. Later, following the launch on my Sabon X by Linotype, I recall of this comment by John Berry, saying that more you're close to the Roman, more you feel Jan Schichold on the style, more you're close to the black, more you feel my style. Since years in books about typography, Trajan capitals are the absolute reference of what is a Roman inscription models. model. Why this model? With this large R, serifless M on N, and not other model with serified M, N, and smaller R. Each year, I'm visiting the Musée Gallo Romain in Lyon because of Typeris field trip. There is much more variety than just the Trajan capitals. Same in Italy, where I was for 15 days last year. So many different styles, different proportions. I re-ask the question, why Trajan should be the absolute model? Why others are almost in Europe? How to judge that a revival is better than another? Based on what? Your knowledge of the existing source? Maybe you don't know perfectly all the sources. Maybe you have, to, you have in mind many other revivals of the same genre, and you compare this new revival to them. Why suddenly one will be better than another? OK, let's say that this new revival shape are more clean. Maybe too perfect? Or maybe you feel the style of the contemporary designer behind will have a direct influence on your verdict. Recall all the subtle imperfection of ITC Bodoni Six Point by Summerstone published in 93. A text size suddenly is more legible than any other Bodoni available in type from catalog at the time. It was a move forward on the redefinition of what is a Bodoni revival at the time. As we are alone in this room, I will share my opinion with you about two beautiful typefaces. I like very much Adobe Garamond when it was published in 89, but I feel it too soft, too round, too wide, more close to Italian models than the French ones. Two years ago at Copper Hewitt Museum in New York, I seen the Italic of Ildane. I was not able to feel the Frenchness on his revival of Renaissance typeface. This indeed doesn't mean that I don't like the design of Hildane by Chris Worsby. With these two examples of eye design by two world masters, I just to point out that nobody has a definitive answer. As you can judge, my appreciation for these two typefaces is personal, and my closest friend even not agree with me. In fact, a revival is an highly subjective topic, almost impossible to judge in a Cartesian way. 
especially because nobody can be sure which source is really cut by Claude Garamond or William Caslon. Maybe it's better to, to call such classic a genre. It doesn't make more sense to say, let's design a new typeface in a genre of bodily than actually to do a revival. To come back to the roots, where to strictly draw the line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as a source to create a new typeface. Back in 2003, John Donner on Call It What It Is, essay published by Emig, he referred to Paul F. Gill talk at ATIPI the year before as an attempt to describe what is a revival. Let's just resolve not to call them historical reproduction, rocketing, or even redesign, unless we intend to do just that, reproduce a type that works like the original. You have to recall that Hermann Zapf suffered from pirated version of many of his typeface during the phototype era and more recently with Book Antique War, a pirated version of Palatino sold by Monotype to Microsoft until it was resolved 20 years later with a genuine design Palatino expanded by Zapf and sold by Linotype to Microsoft. I have a very clear memory of that day during ATIPI Antwerp, 93, conference when Hermann Zapf left the non-profit organization because he never reached its initial goal, to set ethics in our small industry and to fight piracy. 26 years later, ATIPI still have to resolve this issue with certain board members. In the classical typography in computer age essay by M. Anzav, published in 91, he points that the ease with which letter forms can be altered presents a serious threat to the integrity of design. On the next paragraph, Herman is even more clear. Cosmetic change on the manipulation of letter forms pose a question of ethics as serious as pose when one artist steals another artist's design ideas. The point of Hermann Zapf was even more fun fundamental than just piracy case he suffered from. To him, certain typeface recently adapted to the new digital world is like transplanting alphabets between the incompatible technology of photocomposition and laser printing. Pure copy of such historical face as Garamond clash with computer age, not just technologically, but also stylistically. Don't take me wrong. Herman Zapp isn't Susanna Lichko. I like both of them for sure. To be in a typeface design jury with Herman Zapp is quite a wonderful experience, as well discussing with Susanna Lichko all over the year. Herman Zapp's style is unique, in short, more conventional than Susanna Lichko's style. So when he points that the new technology demands new design, it means that the role of the designer is to understand the past, the present, the technology, to produce a unique piece of design, unique piece of design. Not producing a servile copy of an existing typeface who worked well at certain period of history. I'm like Zapf as well Donner. I'm not sure it is possible to create a revival or digital typeface or to recreate a typeface who existed in the technology who produce high quality artworks accessible to you as a designer today. More the source is perfect, more you can ask that your revival will be equally perfect, but more it will be a servile copy version and more it will be not original at all. Quickly classify as a pirated version if you work, work it without an agreement with the author of the source. As you can see, this late, later case doesn't make any sense. Why doing such pirated revival? What will be your reaction if someone told you that he will do a revival of ITC Galliard? There is no hazard. For the MoMA, the medium of ITC Galliard is digital typeface. Think about that. What makes something new is when you feel the human expression of the author, nothing else. When you notice the difference when looking at Hermann Zapf curve versus Adrien Frutier curve, and you feel two opposite design world, 
to feel the difference should be the absolute reference, nothing else. These are uh, the actual drawings of Adrien Frutiger at seven size, seven centimeters, seven centimeters high for the um, Roissy Italic. Let's conclude with this imaginary young designer asking about the best attitude regarding designing new, new typeface. You have to keep your idea fresh from external influence as possible not just because you have a very high view of your design expertise, but because ethics are above everything. No shortcuts, no opportunism, no surfing on the genre, and don't open the door to imitation of others. You don't need that as a professional. The originality of your design and the co copyright protection attached, especially in Europe, aim to valorize and secure your works. One of the main issues for the future is to what extent the dominant position companies which position to, is to favor open source will respect ethics as well as copyright on, on, on thus the creativity and diversity. The situation up today is upsetting. On you, young designer, you have to fight for your rights in order to valorize and protect good design. Imitation start when you feel insecure in your capacities but the result effect is even worse. As you compensate your insecurity by copying even more others. When you copy to imitate the master, you stop to exercise your critical eyes. You simply refuse to learn how to see. You prefer easy money. You lose your soul, you destroy the industry. You offer good argument to certain worldwide companies who launch copycat version of every genre, every recent success. Don't kill the future. Don't kill your future. Thank you very much. <laughs>